Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue with direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Dr. Wright, believe that we were talking about your experience um, with regard to your general experience with regard to sexually violent perpetrators and psychosexual risk assessments. Yes. Could you tell us, can you kind of explain to us what your experience is in, this, in that area? Well, uh, back east, before I came out here, I was often referred through the courts uh, cases of sexual abuse or sexual molestation that I was asked to do an evaluation of to help determine the relative risk of the perpetrator. I also dealt with victims of child sexual abuse and also with rape victims as part of my regular routine. When I came out to Arizona, Arizona had recently passed the sexually violent perpetrator law, and um, that involved the, uh, a jury deciding on whether or not someone who has already served their term and is being released uh, meets a certain criteria that would involuntarily commit them to the state hospital for treatment of their deviant sexual proclivity, usually cases of pedophilia or rape or voyeurism or exhibitionism. These are fairly common sexual deviancies. And um, I took the training that was uh, given here, and there was quite a bit of it back in the 1990 or thereabouts. And uh, I began to receive cases from uh, first the public defender and then private attorneys and so on. And since that time, I've done about 660 uh, psychosexual risk assessments or sexually violent perpetrator evaluations, roughly maybe 60% risk assessments in the other SVP. And I've also testified numerous times in the SVP trial process. Did you, ever, did you ever work with people who were accused of such things? Oh, yes, absolutely. And what kind of work did you do with them, besides these evaluations? Well, here I, in Arizona, I don't do therapy any longer. But back east, I was routinely referred cases through the court for outpatient sex offender treatment. The New Jersey system was, is a bit different from here. And um, there, uh, there is a, a fixed a five, there was, at least at the time, a five-year sentence that included attendance or uh, incarceration at a, a special hospital that was a, also a prison, and they would be there for f up to a five-year period where they would receive both treatment and be incarcerated at the same time. Then they were released, and if they, it was felt they needed more therapy, I would be court-ordered to treat them, continuing in sex offender treatment. Okay. Um, and is there literature that you would have read or studied with regard to this area? Tremendous amount. Based on all of this information, when you um, would read the literature or in dealing with the people uh, that you worked with, did, did you find that there was any type of behavior with regard to the family members and how they would treat the person who was accused? If the relationship was intact, uh, there would be a tendency on the part of the family to try to protect the one who was accused, except in cases of pedophilia where their own biological or uh, uh, stepchildren were involved. Then it would become more complicated, and sometimes uh, the reports were made. And when you say in cases, I'm sorry. Sorry. When you say in cases of pedophilia, you mean, do you mean that the child was actually uh, touched or harmed? Child molestation is perhaps a better way of this, because pedophilia is a specialized diagnosis, but child molestation cases. Um, there would be a tendency on the part of the families to protect the perpetrator. And so uh, many times the supportive work had to be done with family members as well. Obviously they were, were victims within the family, the likelihood of protecting the perpetrator would be less. Okay. And so when you talk about protecting the uh, person who's been accused, what do you mean by protecting? Uh, uh, they, they may not be a phone call made to the authorities, to the police, to report it. Um, there may be a tendency on the part of a spouse, for example, to make up excuses, even sometimes to deny the fact that their own child was molested. And we see this happening fairly regularly. And it's just a natural tendency to want to protect, to want to cover up something uh, such as uh, child molestation. Okay. Now, 
uh, switching to a different switching to a different area. I know you've talked before with us about uh, Jody's journals. Yes. And uh, have you read them all? I believe I did. Yes. Um, and they started about when? It was either junior high school or high school. Okay. And from there, did she pretty much consistently journal? Yes. And in her journals, you had mentioned before, I think, that, that she seemed to take a uh, look at life through rose-colored glasses. Yes, she did. Did she accentuate the positive? Always. One of the issues, uh, well, did, did Ms. Arias ever speak to you about uh, when Mr. Alexander broke her finger? Yes. And did this happen in January of 2008? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's in evidence as exhibit number 456. Do you see that's a journal entry from January 24th of 2008? Yes, I do. And based on your information, is that uh, a few days after Mr. Alexander broke her finger. Yes. I'm sorry, what was your answer, doctor? Yes. Okay. Now, this is just part of the journal entry that we have, but we see in the beginning. Well, objection misstates the uh, evidence. It is the journal entry of Thursday, January 24, 2008, and it's actually initialed at the end. Um, judge, it's not the complete entry for January 24th of 2008. That's what I said. All right. Overruled. You may continue. All right. So we have this this partial entry of January twenty from January twenty fourth, two thousand eight. We see in the beginning, she says that there has been nothing noteworthy to report. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Now, if we look at the entire entry from January twenty fourth of two thousand eight, she actually does go on to speak of Travis. Yes. And you see the highlighted part. I do. And she says in the highlighted part, well, speaking of Travis, he frustrates me and he thrills me. I love, love, love him and he sings to me. He goes out of his way for me, displays massive amount of unconditional love for me in countless ways. You see that? I do. And so she's speaking very positively about him, right? Yes. Is this something that she did often? Regularly. And then she goes on to talk about how she's almost haunted by it but it still remains that she cannot marry him. And she goes on to say, I don't have, can't, or she, she must, um, I think she cuts that out. I can't, I can't quite put my finger on it, but something is just off with that boy. We've all got head problems and that's for sure, but there are certain things that will never sit right with me about him. Do you see that? I do. All right. And based on your information, this was days after he broke her finger, right? Yes. And this, this information, this journal entry is all together part of January 24th of 2008. Is yes. that right? Is this, in this journal entry, is that something, is that consistent with the way she would write things, uh, negative things? Yes, they were very mild. Judge, the foundation of the negative things has he seen. Judge, the foundation is he's read through all her journals. He's aware of the different journal entries when she would speak negatively about Mr. Alexander. All right, overruled. Um, whenever she would be writing about Mr. Alexander, it was generally very, very positive. If there were any problems, she would usually couch it in terms of somehow she did something to displease him. And she was just very effusive and uh, positive about him. I don't remember seeing a negative thing written. And when you say negative, you, do you mean something that's detailed negative? That's detailed negative. That's right. Good okay. point. Okay. And did she ever talk to you about the law of attraction? Yes. And what is that? Well, the law of attraction is... Uh, do you know what the law of attraction is? Well, I have an idea. It may not be exactly what she's thinking about it, but yeah. Based on what Ms. Arias told you, do you know what she believed it to be? She believed that if you put positive relevance as to his opinion that Council Fletch, please.
You may continue. All right, Dr. Samuels, with regard to the law of attraction, did Ms. Arias speak to you about it? She did. She talked about it fairly frequently. Okay. And what, what, what did she talk about that it meant to her? Well, it meant that if you put positive statements out there, if you have a positive attitude towards life, then life will, will treat you to positive experiences, and you will grow through that. Uh, so you have to sort of create your own future by putting out positive vibes and by um, expressing the, 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 the goals that you have in life and so forth. And apparently it was part of what she was learning uh, with the prepaid legal plan. Okay. And thank you. And did she, uh, did she talk to you about her journal writing with regard to the law of attraction? Yes, she did. And in your reading of her journals, did you see that she would mention the law of attraction? Oh, many, many times. And so when we're talking about something where she talks about uh, that there's just something wrong with that boy, is that consistent with somebody following the law of attraction by being not too negative? Yes. All right, I wanted to talk to you about PTSD and its effects on the effects that it has on people. Okay. okay? First, I want to ask, does everybody who experiences a trauma, like an acute, something that puts them into acute stress, so some, a, a severe trauma, does everyone who experiences a severe trauma often then lead to PTSD? No. Okay, how does that work? Well, um, typically, maybe I shouldn't use the word typically, but one of the characteristics of a post-traumatic stress disorder is that people who are so diagnosed share a common set of symptoms. The symptoms are listed in the DSM. And um, one of the characteristics that remains consistent is the fact that they have undergone an atypical stressor. In other words, I'm sorry, you said atypical? Atypical. Okay. Atypical, meaning not typical. Okay. Um, meaning that it's a stressor out of the realm of normal experience. So um, it's less likely to develop if a person has a mild automobile accident. It's more likely to occur if they're involved in a killing situation. Um, not everyone who suffers from an acute stress disorder or from even milder forms of stress will develop PTSD. And the criteria are very specific. But if you've been diagnosed with PTSD, then there are a series of repetitive, consistent stimuli that is shared by a group of those that receive that diagnosis. And not everyone who's diagnosed with PTSD shares the exact same symptoms either, because the criteria that are uh, placed in the DSM, uh, for example, in one criteria, I'm not going to go into it, uh, there are five possibilities, and if one of those exists, then it meets that particular criteria. Or in another case, three out of seven. So not everybody is exactly the same, but they do share a list of common experiences, symptoms, I should say, and they all have an experience in a typical or unusual stressor. And what if they're the person who caused the stress? So take, for example, you said a killing. For example, let, if somebody gets into a car accident and runs someone over and actually kills the, the pedestrian. Yes, can that person, person driving, can that, that, person that person could develop post-traumatic stress disorder. There is much current research, new research, that has explored the area of can someone who is involved in harming another uh, develop post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And even though I saw that regularly working with police officers that I was treating and dealing with for uh, accidental shooting incidents, um, the area was never really studied until the past 10 years or so. But the evidence that does exist does suggest that people who are involved in, in causing harm to another can develop PTSD as a result of the harm they have caused. All right. Uh, and actually, before we get it all the way into PTSD again, the, uh, when you first met Ms. Arias, did you have an opinion with regard to her self-esteem? Yes, I did. What was that? That it was very low. And how do you form such a thing? How do you know that? Well, based upon her history, what she was telling me at the time about her past relationships, about her childhood, how she was reared, uh, certain interactions she had with her parents, uh, it almost cried out to me that this is a young woman who was suffering from very low self-esteem. 
And when somebody suffers from low self-esteem, can that make you uh, more likely to suffer from other diagnoses? Diagnoses. Well, we find that low self-esteem is a characteristic of many different kinds of psychological disorders. So the answer to that would be yes. Okay. And throughout the time that you met with Miss Arias, did you ever notice a change in her self-esteem? Yes, over the years, I found that her personality seemed to strengthen. Um, she became somewhat more self-confident, um, more assertive. She was able to communicate more freely and openly. And uh, I saw that uh, as a positive indication. All right, and was that always the case? With I mean, her, what, you mean? L later on, when, when you see that she became stronger or more confident, was she always like that? No, she was not. I mean, people have their ups and downs. Some days she would be depressed. Some days she would be more outgoing. Other days she would be more apprehensive. But in the typical course of working with someone over time, you do see those changes. And, and that brings up an, uh, another issue, too. You say working with someone over time. The time that you spent with Ms. Arias was for what purpose? The purpose was to conduct a thorough evaluation and, and develop a report with a diagnosis. And um, the, the approach that I took was to spend several interview sessions, develop rapport. I think I may have mentioned this the last time. Um, and then, uh, of course, in Ms. Arias's case, uh, we had to overcome the fact that she was still uh, in an acute state of denial and was not able to deal with the reality of what had happened. Uh, although she finally came about and, and shared the uh, what we believe to be the true story. To be the true story. The stain. Oh, okay, go on. Okay, she told a different alternative version, and um, so uh, that allowed me to spend more time delving into the facts, or to the best of her recollection, of what actually happened on that fateful night. Well, for, yeah. All right, and so. Um, do you spend time, when you're spending that time with her, is, it, is there ever a purpose for therapy? Well, not when you're doing an evaluation. And I would very often almost have to restrain myself and not do therapy because that wasn't my role. But I did see a growth within her as she became more comfortable with the story that she ultimately changed to, which she told us. And um, so, no, no therapy that I would call therapy was conducted. Okay. And if you were treating her, if she was actually a patient of yours and you were conducting some sort of therapy, uh, what, would you see her more often? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, of course, things are different now in psychotherapy than they were when I first started because of insurance limitations and uh, uh, insurance companies changing the rules. But on a regular basis, someone like Ms. Arias would probably be seen a couple of times a week if we lived in an ideal world uh, for the first few months and then perhaps once a week. Over a period of time, it would titrate down to maybe twice monthly, then once a month, then six months until they no longer felt they needed it. Okay. But like you said, that was not your goal. The, you were doing evaluation. I was doing only evaluation. Okay. All right, so when somebody is diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress, how, does it have an effect on their ability to express emotions? It can, because one of the characteristics, one of the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder are, is blunted affect. What is a blunted well, affect? Blunted affect means a, a constriction in their ability to show and express emotion. So uh, we will see uh, a, 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 an emotive state that doesn't seem to jive with what they're talking about. There's a disconnect sometimes between the emotion connected to the statement and the statement. And do we know why that happens? Um, it may have to do with uh, emotional constriction. Right now I'm venturing into the psychotherapeutic jargon. I can't tell you what structure in the brain is responsible for that, but we know that it's not atypical. It happens. When, when the person suffers from this particular disorder. There's a restricted range of affect. We, we see that happen. Uh, a feeling of detachment, a disconnection, sometimes to relationships, sometimes to situations. Um, Do they have that detachment when they're talking about the situation that caused the, the trauma that can be responsible for the PTSD? Sometimes it's so horrific that you can't deal with it openly. You have to skirt the issue. You have to cushion 
yourself because once you start talking about what really what you, you experienced, it can co break you down. And it's almost like a re-experiencing of the actual trauma. So yes, that's quite common in this type of disorder. What about if the person is under stress at the time that they're discussing, that, that they're talking? Does, does additional stress, uh, can that affect somebody who's been diagnosed with PTSD? Well, it can. Um, it depends upon, upon the topic that's being discussed as well. But we know, for example, that um, it can be very difficult for a soldier to talk about a particularly bad experience that they've had. And part of the therapy helps them to get to the point where it can be brought out in the open. But one would not just dive right in there and start presenting them, hammering them with this, with this experience again, because that could be very detrimental to their treatment. So if the person is, is for example, with Miss Arias, if she's testifying, is that considered, generally speaking, a stressful situation? Yes. Lack of foundation. He's testified, so he has the foundation, and it's relevant as to her. As Overall, you may answer. Uh, yes, testifying for anyone can be stressful. And so, uh, yes, stress, testifying for her probably would have been stressful. And so when you add that stress uh, upon her being diagnosed with PTSD, um, does, that, does that cause any additional issues with regard to the blunted affect? Does it make it more or less likely or things like that? Well, I can't say exactly what would happen to a particular person that has the potential for doing that, okay. has the potential for confusing them. It has the attention, the, the, the possibility rather of uh, eliciting intrusive thoughts that distract the person from answering the particular question, but I can't say for sure. Generally speaking. Uh, generally speaking is what I am sure about that. Okay. Part of this uh, detachment that you talk about, is that, is that a defense mechanism? It can be a defense mechanism to block the individual's contact, psychological contact, with the initial stressor. So um, in some cases, it, it can, sometimes amnesia can actually be a help by protecting that person, although it's not caused by that necessarily, it's caused by the fact that the memories aren't actually inscribed in the brain. But yes, um, by creating an alternative, uh, an alternative reality, which we call derealization, um, a person puts distance between themselves and the actual event, which may have been very horrific. Is that something that you have seen in your practice? Oh, yes. Does that happen frequently or normally? or? It it's hard to give a percentage, but I have seen it enough to be aware that it does exist as a possibility, yes. All right, and did you see any evidence of Ms. Arias uh, doing things, you said derealization? Yes. Did you see any evidence of that? Well, initially when the uh, story was told about these intruders, that to me was a disconnect from reality. Okay, um, and what about, we know that she called and left a voicemail for message for Travis after she left his house on June 4th. What does that tell you? Again, and again, uh, I, I would have to say that this is uh, typical. I'm talking about examples here. But it could very well have been the result of her need to distance herself emotionally from the, from the horror that occurred on that day. And by pretending, but not necessarily in a conscious level, but by creating her alternative reality it's as if it didn't happen, and it reduces the level of stress. Strange as it sounds, these things do occur. We know that after that, she, she went on to Utah and spent some time with a, a person named Ryan Burns. Uh, and at, to all accounts, things seemed normal for her. Uh, not from her, but by other people explaining her behavior. Is there a psychological explanation for that? Well, it's the same type of, it's basically depersonal. The defendant's mental state. It's a, another way of the mind trying to put psychological distance between, between the, the horror, horror of the event and the reality that that person has to live with. Keeping in mind in Ms. Arias's case that she apparently had no one that she could confide in, not a mother, not a father, not a friend. She was doing this all by herself and the stress must have been incredible. Uh, we know that she spoke to a friend, Leslie Udy, and, and made statements about the wish for her to, her children someday, to play with Travis's children someday. Um, when we all know that was not going to happen now, 
Is that the same type of behavior you're talking about? Yes, it is. It, it almost borders on the delusional, but she did not meet that particular diagnostic criteria. Okay, so to be clear, you're not saying she was delusional? No, I'm not. Okay, all right. So what do you mean then? Well, what I mean is that the, re the alternative reality that is created is so contrary to what actually happened uh, that, it, that it would be very difficult for a person to even make those statements if they genuinely, some part of them, didn't believe that but weren't functioning as if the alternative reality was reality. Okay. Uh, we know that she sent flowers to Travis's grandmother uh, afterwards, once the news broke that he had passed away. Is that along the same type of behavior? It's, uh, it's along the same type of behavior. There may have been some genuine sorrow on her part, too but it would be consistent with this concept that I was discussing previously. Okay. And well, let's move on for a sec. Let's talk about uh, tremors and shaking, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, when you were meeting with Miss Arias, did you ever notice her having any tremors or shaking? I did. There were times, and sometimes it was content-related, that I would see her hand shaking like this. And, um, but that's one of the criteria of post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, it's called, the, the, the characteristic is, physiologic reactivity upon exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the... What are you reading from, Doctor? I'm reading from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which I've reproduced in the, on this page. Okay, but so the it's DSM. the criteria from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Okay. We can mark it then. It's well, right. actually, it's already been marked. Doctor, do you have the DSM with you, the red book? I don't have the red book today. I brought my, my little portable okay. version. Okay, then we'll have to mark that then. Okay. But I do need it back. Uh, this is just a portable uh, version. It doesn't have a lot of the explanatory text in it, but it does have all the criteria for all the disorders. So this is we, we carry it around. It's okay. Easy to carry. All right. So you were explaining to us what the specific criteria is on, in PTSD yes. with regard to that how shaking or tremors follow, follows or falls into that. Is that it right? It would fall into that particular criteria. All right. And you were reading it. Criteria. Did you finish reading it? Um, I did. Okay, can you tell us what that meant? Because it was. What it means is that a person responds physiologically. Now, it could mean a number of different physiologic uh, or physical changes, but in this case, I viewed the shaking or the tremor as being the physiologic reactivity. So, when we were talking about certain issues, I, I can't say for sure that it was only when I would speak to her about the incident but uh, there may have been internal or other internal cues that were triggering that. I did observe her shaking on a number of occasions. All right, and when you observe her shaking, is it something that is like epileptic type shaking or is it more mild? No, it's much milder. Okay, is it something that if you, if you weren't looking for it, would you necessarily notice it? No, you might not notice it. Uh, and sometimes you said, you gave us an example before you raised your hand and, and, yeah. and saw it shake. Right. Uh, if her hand was down, is that something that you would notice? Probably then? wouldn't notice it as much. Okay. And what is this? Did she talk to you about the, the shaking? Um, she did tell me on a couple of occasions that she would shake. And in fact, I inquired further when I saw that. And um, she explained how some, the shaking began, I think it was around... I don't want to give a date and not be sure, but I think it was 2007 or something. I'm just mm -hmm. venturing a guess here. And uh, when, when Mr. Alexander would get angry at her, she noticed that she began to shake. So if he would lose his temper at her, she reported to me that she would have that shaking reaction. Okay. And the times that you saw her shaking, was it during times that you were speaking of the incident or... Do um, you know? I, I, I don't know immediately. I, I, I didn't play around with that. It came and went 
I didn't want to get into areas that would necessarily cause the shaking. My time was limited with her. Um, so I didn't do an experiment to, okay. you know, to see. But um, I did notice there were times during certain parts of the conversation that she would begin to shake. And eventually, at some point, she mentioned to me that she was experiencing that shaking. OK. Uh, does the shaking, is that a form of an elevated, of, of anxiety? Yes, it could very well be the result of elevated anxiety. OK. And anxiety is something that is part of PTSD, is that correct? It's a characteristic of PTSD. OK. We know that uh, Ms. Arias has said that when men in particular yell at her or raise their voice to her or are aggressive with her in any way, that that causes her additional stress, basically, anxiety. She told me that, yes. OK. Is that, well, did she talk about that with you? Yes, we talked about that. All right. And, wh and what about it? Well, she said that if, if a man especially is yelling at her or upset with her, that's when she begins to feel most tense, most anxious, and also indicated that sometimes she shakes. Okay. And when somebody is under having anxiety, now this, I guess, to, this type of anxiety or stress, I guess, this would be far different from the, time of str from the type of acute stress there was on June 4th. Is that right. right. What I'm talking about here is typical normal anxiety that most people experience at one time or another. All right. And when people experience what you could say typical normal anxiety, what type of uh, results do you see? Well, we, we may see in some people a, a jittery knee. They start bouncing their knee up and down. Uh, they might scratch their head. There's a displacement activities. Uh, they might uh, feel warm. The skin may turn red. Their heart rate may go up. Their hands may get cold and clammy. These are typical symptoms of an elevated state of anxiety. Do you ever find people have a problem with uh, finding their words or remembering something? Well, yes. Uh, many people experience a, a cognitive disruption when they're extremely anxious and they may have difficulty concentrating. They may difficult, have difficulty in word finding. They may have difficulty remembering certain things. This is a fairly common occurrence, which we also know is stage fright. Even skilled and experienced actors and actresses will go on to the stage and report that prior to their performance, they begin to experience stage fright, which is really just a form of anxiety related to the performance anxieties, that are, the performance stresses that are about to occur to them. So, so like somebody who would forget their lines? They might forget their lines, right. Exactly. OK. Is this something that would be considered, uh, a, a, assuming it happened once in a while, is this something that a person should get mental help for or mental treatment for? Um, it depends. Uh, one of the characteristics of, a, of an issue that requires mental treatment is if it interferes with the life of the individual. So most people go through life without experiencing psychotherapy um, because they can sort of deal with it, some people more effectively than others. But when the issue interrupts your flow of life or creates problems for you, if you, can't, you, can't, you find you can't get on a bus to go to work or, or uh, the light rail and you can't do that, or you can't get in your car, or you can't get stuck in traffic, then obviously that should receive the attention of an appropriate therapist. Okay, but the normal everyday stage fright that people might have, like a kid taking the, a play and getting afraid to stand up in front of people, is that something you would consider mental health treatment is needed? No. In fact, uh, having some anxiety is probably healthy because you begin to learn how to tolerate it, accept it, overcome it. So experiencing anxiety is actually helpful in some respects uh, for making a person more confident in their life. So I guess just as long as it doesn't interrupt your life. That's basically the difference. Yes, that's basically it. OK. Uh, all right, I want to talk to you about the crime scene, OK? So these, these are, well, basically, what do you know? How, what you know of what happened on June 4th uh, is based on what? <clears throat> it's based upon the crime scene photographs that I was shown, police reports, interviews with uh, at least one detective, and um, what later on I was told by Miss Arias to the degree that she was able to remember. 
Okay, and when you say interviews with a detective, do you mean you read interviews? No, there, there was a video recording of oh. uh, some interviews. Okay, so in other words, you didn't conduct the interview? Oh, no, I did not. Okay, but you watched interviews of a detective? Yes. Okay. Uh, and looking at the photos and the information that you know that you've gathered from all of them. May we approach, please?
continue. Could you repeat the question? Yes, because I don't even remember what it yeah. is. Okay. What I want to talk to you about, we talked about what you've looked at uh, in terms of the police reports and listened to interviews. Is that correct? Yes. And um, you looked at the crime scene photos. And is that a yes? Yes, that's a yes. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw you sorry. shaking your head. Um, and uh, and you also, did you also speak with Miss Arias? I did. Okay, and based on all this information, um, is there something about the, the crime scene that tells you more about or supports your um, diagnosis for PTSD and the likelihood of acute stress? Well, certainly um, PTSD was not diagnosed until after the event. But there is some indication that she was in a state of acute stress. Okay, so let, that's what I want to talk about, the indications that she was in a state of acute stress. Yes. Okay. So what is it, based on your review of things, what is it that indicated that she would be in a state of acute stress? Well, there was a certain irrationality to okay. the... Same line. Irrationality? The same. Let me ask you specifically. Um, I, think I, I think I know where you were going. Is there... We know yeah, that... That's what counsel's statements are where he was going. Okay. There was, are you aware that whether or not a gun was found at the scene? Uh, no, no gun was found at the scene. Okay. And are you aware that Ms. Arias has a vague memory of getting rid of it? Yes. Okay. And are you aware that the camera was found at the scene? Yes. And are you aware that Ms. Arias is a photographer? Yes. Are you aware that when the camera was found, it was found in a washer? Yes. And are you aware that as part of the camera, the SD card was still inside? Yes, I was aware of that. And are you aware that the SD card was not trampled on or ruined in any way? Yes. Are you aware that Ms. Arias uh, took the rope that was used to tie her up earlier in the day? Yes. And ultimately left the camera? Yes. What about in the crime scene photos, based on based on the blood in different areas of the bathroom and in the hallway. What does that tell you about a struggle occurring? foundation. He's not a blood spatter expert and state of mind. So when a struggle may have happened, he doesn't know. The stain is raised. The fact that there's blood in more than one area, does that mean that to you that there was movement in the bathroom? He's not an expert in blood spatter, indicating how the blood got there. Judge, you don't need to be an expert to know if blood's in different areas the person moved. Counsel approach, please. You may continue. Okay, based on the crime scene photos that you reviewed, did the crime scene seem, did the bathroom area in the hallway, did it seem disorganized to you? Yes, it did. Um,
Are you aware that Miss Arias' handprint was left on the wall? Yes. And are you aware that her hair was found? Yes. Are you aware that on the camera in the washer were pictures of Miss Arias? Yes. And then. Objection is this testimony. Pictures that were deleted. Over. Thank you. The. Ultimately, Mr. Alexander's body was, where was it found? It was found in the tub. In the tub or the shower? In the shower. Okay. And uh, found in the shower, based on your reading of the report and everything that you knew, was that, um, was he put there? Yes. And based on what we know, it would have been Miss Arias that would have had to do it, right? Yes. So... What does it take for someone the size of Miss Arias to put someone the size of Mr. Alexander into a shower? Objection. She's not a scene reconstructionist. She doesn't know where she's worked out. She doesn't know what she looked like at that time. She can't possibly know that. It's saying this Christ. Do you know if it ta would take strength for someone to lift up someone heavier than they are? Objection. Relevance uh, and beyond the scope of uh, his teachings as a psychologist. Yes, it would take uh, a great deal of strength, of excessive strength, for someone Ms. Arias' size to move. Objection lack of foundation as to what Ms. Arias' size were. Objection lack of foundation as to how much Mr. Alexander weighed. Sustained as to foundation. Dr. Samuels, when you met Ms. Arias, this was what, in December of 2009, Nine. right? Yes. Okay. Um, and have you seen photos of what Ms. Arias looked like in 2008? Yes. And did you see photos of what Mr. Alexander looked like in 2008? Yes. Was Mr. Based on those photos, was Mr. Alexander bigger than yes. Ms. Arias? Yes. And so in order for someone who is smaller, like Ms. Arias, to pick up or move someone who is bigger, like Mr. Alexander, does that require strength? Objection. Lack of foundation. Again, that's beyond his expertise. He may have seen photographs. He doesn't have weights. He doesn't have heights. Judge, can we not have speaking objections? Sustained. Uh, So you were allowed to answer that question. I don't think you did. No, it, to me, it would take a great deal of strength Objection, to move. Lack of foundation. Great deal of strength. Lack of foundation. I, I think we just went over the foundation. Overruled. You may, you may continue. Yes, to me, it would, take, uh, it would take someone with a great deal of strength to make a move of a body under those conditions. And earlier you had talked about, and this might have been Thursday, but earlier you had talked about uh, people who have a great deal of strength, like the stories we hear of mothers being able to lift a car off their child in great periods of stress. Is that correct? Yes. And so what does it tell you then when you have somebody in pictures that you've seen, Miss Arias' size, being able to lift up someone <coughs> the size of Mr. Alexander and actually put him into the shower? It would suggest to me that she was indeed in a state of acute stress and that the adrenaline was pumping and that glucose was going to her body. She was, it seems to me that she was in a flight or fight mode. All right. Thank you, Dr. Samuels. Nothing further. Cross-examination. Sir, one of the things that we know is that you told us that you were hired to conduct a psychological evaluation, right? Yes. And that's different than being hired for therapeutic purposes, right? Yes. You've done both of them, haven't you? No. Well, you haven't done any therapy. I thought in the complaint that you had, uh, you treated some people. In this case? Not in this case. Ever. Have you ever done any therapy? Oh, sure, yes. I thought that's... 
So there is a difference, right? Oh, yes. And in this case, the focus is on trying to uh, reach, if you will, a diagnosis with regard to a certain event and certain facts that are presented, right? Yes. And with treatment, it's um, different, isn't it? Yes. With treatment, you're trying to help the individual, correct? Well, usually there's a process of diagnosis. Are you trying to hurt them or help them? So that would have to be allowed to answer the question. Sustained. Okay. Could you please repeat your question? Are you trying to help them or hurt them when you're treating them? Of course I'm trying to help them. And in this particular case, sir, one of the things that you did was that you took on a little, not only, but you took on a treatment role with regard to the defendant, didn't you? No, I did not. Well, do you remember that we talked about a situation? Okay. Here we approach. Yes, you may. an early recess. Please be back in the designated area at 10 minutes after 3. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Please be seated. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Mr. Nermy. Your Honor, the, the uh, state uh, knows that there is a motion in limine filed regarding uh, my withdrawal and all the circumstances around it. It is trying to parse around uh, this idea uh, by saying that Dr. Samuels went there um, because Ms. Arias was depressed still not in a therapeutic role, but he knows the full explanation of which gets into a area for which there is no uh, retort without violating the motion in limine. So obviously the state is trying to set up a situation of an unfairness to Miss Arias under the Sixth Amendment and Trombetta to keep going into an area which he knows that the response would go into a prohibited area. Go, putting that is, uh, doing that, while clever, is not consistent with her, her Sixth Amendment right 
and her due process rights to a fair trial. So, Your Honor, based on that, going into an area, with the explanation of which it violates a pretrial ruling of this court, is just as egregious as, if not more so, than going into the area itself. We ask this court to hold the state accountable in this instance to not have them violate Ms. Arias' rights in this manner and uphold its pretrial ruling. All right, on that issue. The clip that I want to play and the background of it is that this is an individual who's hired as taxpayer money to go in and conduct an assessment. When the defendant is depressed, I think in violation of that mandate that he go and assess her, what happens is this is the exchange that he and I had with regard to that issue. His answer was, and um, so that was a big issue. And I said, okay. And then he said, she was very upset. I don't, this was not really planned. I said, okay. My answer, his answer was, but I, in response to her depression and being upset, I was asked to go and to talk to her. And I said, okay. And then did, and he said, so I don't know how much relative to the case. I'm entitled, I'm allowed to go into this particular area where he has assumed a treatment role. Not only did he do that with regard to this particular issue, he also sent her gifts and that sort of thing. This is just part of that, where he crossed the line again, where he blurred the line between being someone who treats and someone who uh, is there to evaluate. Ms. Wilmot. Judge, at the time that uh, I believe that Mr. Martinez is just talking about, it's not a complete transcript. What they're doing during that interview is he's going through Mr. Dr. Samuel's notes. Mr. Martinez is going through Dr. Samuel's notes and asking him what he means by that. Uh, he says, in respect, talking about, no, Kirk leaves around the 28th. This is when Kirk's status changed. And so that was a big issue. She was very upset. I don't, this was not really planned, right? And then Mr. Martinez says, right. And then the full paragraph is, Ms. Dr. Samuel says, in respect for her, in respect to her depression and being upset, I was asked to go and talk to her. Don't know how much relevance to the case it is. Um, she said that she felt no hope after Kirk announced that he was, and Mr. Martinez interrupts him, what is this, served a card at the top? And then they talk about send a card. Oh, send a card. And he's looking at his notes. He's asking Dr. Samuel to give his notes, uh, explain what his notes mean. That's all that's said about it. But it is clearly a, specifically about Mr. Nermi. Um, when there was the possibility that he was going to leave the case, and now, and that's specifically as to her depression. It doesn't talk about him treating her depression. It was just that he was asked to go and speak with her. There's no therapy involved. I can't follow up on this, that, that there was adequately follow up on this with him on redirect because it, what it goes into, it's completely irrelevant. Judge, he can tell us that there was no therapy involved. He just doesn't have to tell us what the subject was. I'm not asking him what the subject was. Uh, he can say, no, there wasn't any therapy involved. I just spent an hour, two hours, however long he spent there. And, you know, that, that, that's the kind of thing that is allowable under, in cross-examination. Additionally, the fact that he's sending her cards and that sort of thing, again, that goes to the treat, treatment aspect, not an assessment aspect. And it goes to show his bias. Judge, therein lies the problem. If he's not going to ask him, and he shouldn't be allowed to ask him, what the depression was over and why he was asked to go talk to her. That's the problem is we can't ask that question because that question is completely irrelevant and prejudicial to Miss Arias. So we can't go into that. So then the jury is left with this confusion and prejudicial information that she was having depression and that he was asked to go and speak with her. That's not the truth. That's not the case. Martinez. And Judge, I have to say as it goes on, because I know Miss Wilmot wasn't present during this interview, uh, as Dr. Samuels could explain and would have to explain, you know, Mr. Martinez completely mischaracterized what was said. The, the, the card was intended for me, not Miss Arias. And he's saying that she's sending her card. He's sending her cards. Again, that's completely inappropriate and it would go right into that area of me leaving and leaving the case. So it's a, again a mischaracterization, which is habitual, but certainly Ill, illustrative of the uh, idea that retort on this opens up a, um, a previously precluded area and the sin is just as great what the state is attempting to do. I was there 
card was sent to help her feel better. It had nothing to do with him. So. Mr. Martinez, the point is that you're trying to make uh, that therapy was provided right. by Dr. Samuel. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he did. He went to see her about her depression, and then he provided a card, and it's not the only occasion that he's done it. He's done it on another occasion. From the defense, why is it necessary to talk about the subject matter discussed if the point is only that Dr. Samuels provided therapy to the defendant? That's the point is he didn't provide therapy because this wasn't a depression in the sense that an actual depression where she's going to be diagnosed with depression and therefore needs therapy. It's the fact that this news caused great problems for Miss Arias and how she felt about herself and how she felt about the case and it causes problems then with communication between client and attorney and so that's the greater issue judge it has absolutely no relevance to therapy because there was no therapy and again with this card issue the rest of the transcript bears out that it, the cards talking about Mr. Nomi. Dr. Samuels did you provide therapy to the defendant in this instance? No of course not. All right I'm going to sustain the objection to that question. Now, with regard to the other issue that was discussed at the bench, the copy of the interview, Mr. Nermy? Yeah, oh, yes. Detective Flores, do you have a copy of an interview that was conducted last Thursday? Recording? Yes, I can get that, and I will provide that tomorrow. All right. First thing tomorrow morning? Yes, first thing. All right. Is there anything else before the break? Nothing, Your Honor. All right. We're at recess.